Well, good morning, Hope Fellowship. My name is Jeff Brewer. I'm one of the pastors here. We're glad to be able to worship together. Thankful that Aaron Camp is going to be preaching the word here in just a little while. But for our call to worship, hear Matthew chapter 6. Let's rejoice in our great Father in heaven. Hallowed be his name. Let's sing together and give him praise. Church, let's sing together. Majesty, your glory is shining brighter than the moon and the stars. Marveling, we honor and fear you above all gods, glorious and mighty. You're awesome in beauty, joyful songs we raise. Glorious and mighty, you're awesome in beauty, greatly to be praised. Majesty, you fashioned the heavens, your decrees can never be changed. Over all the plans of the nations, your judgments reign. Glorious and mighty, you're awesome in beauty, joyful song. Glorious and mighty, you're awesome in beauty, greatly to be praised. Majesty will sing with creation when you come again in the clouds every knee will bow down and worship the one true god glorious and mighty you're awesome in beauty joyful songs we Awesome in beauty, greatly to be Your glorious cause, O oh God, engages our hearts. May Jesus Christ be known wherever we are. We ask not for ourselves, but for your renown. The cross has saved us, so we pray. Your kingdom come, let your kingdom come, let your will be done, so that everyone might know your name. Let your song be heard, every Sovereign work on earth is done. Let your kingdom come. 
Give us your strength, O oh God, and courage to speak. Perform your wondrous deeds through those who are weak. Lord, use us as you want, whatever the test. By grace we'll preach your gospel. Dying breath. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. So that everyone might know your name. Let your song be heard. Every Before our time of prayer, listen to James chapter 4, which seems so appropriate as we head into this new year just a few days in, as we think back to the last year and how last year, at the beginning of the year, we could have never known all that was coming and all that was unfolding. Listen to James chapter 4. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance, and all such boasting is evil. Let's go before our God and let's acknowledge just how easy it is for us to make plans that we cannot possibly know will come to fruition. Let's trust in him and his will. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you that as we have this opportunity, we're just reminded afresh at the beginning of a new year, we are not God. We're not in control we don't know what this hour or this coming afternoon or this coming week or month, certainly this year, will hold, just as we didn't last year. We, con- we confess before you our pride, how easy it is for us to think we are autonomous, that we are the ruler of our own lives, that we can live and act and make profits and do whatever we want if we just work hard enough. So, Father, we thank you that You take these times to remind us you are the one who is sovereign. You are the one who is in control. You are God. Father, in this year ahead, we pray we would be people of your word. We pray we would hunger for your word in a a greater way than we did in this past year. We pray in 2021 that we would be people who communicate with our Heavenly Father, that we come before you in prayer. Above all, Lord, we pray that we would be people who remember the good news of your Son, that you have given to us Jesus. He has saved us from our sins. Help us to remember the cross. Help us to remember our sin. And in every one look we take at our sin, help us to take ten looks at Jesus. Father, we trust in you in the year ahead. We pray for our plans as a church. We pray that we would be people who take bold risks, bold steps of faith for you. Oh Lord, would you see fit to help us as we seek to pray about a church being being planted. Father, thank you for providing for all our needs. Would you help us to be faithful to use those, uh, what you have provided in a way that would establish another congregation, we pray. Father, we pray for those that we support around the world, and we think in particular of Karakama Cross Baptist Church in Ireland. Father, we pray for them as they seek to plant a church 
We thank you that you are going before them as you go before us. All we have is the plans that we can think, trusting that are from you, but Lord, we submit them to you and we pray for this church there in Ireland, that they would be a bright witness for you. Father, we pray for us in our neighborhoods, that you would help us to be great witnesses for you and in our homes. May we show the light of Christ. We thank you for his grace. We thank you for your goodness. And we pray that you would be glorified as your word is preached now. May you bless Aaron as he preaches. May you bless us as we hear your word preached. Help us not to just be hearers of your word, but doers. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn, our sins they are many, His mercy is more. What love could remember, no wrongs we have omniscient all-knowing he counts not their sum thrown into a sea without bottom or shore our sins they are many his mercy is more praise the lord his mercy is more than darkness new every morn our sins they are many his mercy is more patience would wait as we constantly roam what father so tender is calling us home he welcomes the weakest the vilest the poor the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn, our sins they are many, His mercy is more. What riches of kindness He lavished on us. His blood was the payment, his life was the cost. We stood neath the debt we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more. darkness new every morn our sins they are many his mercy is more praise the lord his mercy is more stronger than darkness new every morn our sins they are many his mercy is more our sins they are many Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Good morning to everyone at home and a happy 2021 to you. My name is Aaron Camp and I'm one of the elders here at Hope Fellowship. Um, it's my honor to preach the word today. So we'll jump right into that in just a moment. I did want to address one thing real quick. Um, this is not the way that many of us would choose to start 2021. Uh, things are still weird. So I would just say there's two quick thoughts. The first is gratitude to the Lord that we can still hear from his word, that we can still worship in some way together 
through these means of technology that are just completely unexpected and unknown to most of human history. The second is that it's an opportunity to draw near to God in dependence on him together while things are still off, while things are still hard. So as a family, let's do that. And let's begin by showing God our dependence by praying to him now as we look at his word. Our Heavenly Father, may your name be lifted up and revered in our time together. We share the same desire as your disciples so many years ago when they asked, Lord, teach us to pray. Please forgive us for our struggles to take hold of this great gift and direct us towards a lifelong, joy-filled conversation with you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today we'll be looking at Matthew 6, verses 5 through 15. And this section is famously referred to as the Lord's Prayer. It's one of those passages that we could spend an entire sermon on each and every single line. We're not going to do that today. This is much more of an overview take, but just to highlight the the beauty of this passage, I want to bring up this great quote by Bible commentator Doug O'Donnell. He begins this his uh, commentary on Matthew with this analogy. One way that you know that a work of art is a masterpiece is that you cannot exhaust it with observations. You can stare at it for hours and still miss important facets. And then each time you return to stare at it, again, you will find new and wonderful aspects you never saw before. Components that continue to reveal the true genius of its creator. He's referring to the masterpiece of the Lord's Prayer here. And today, we have the privilege to look at this masterpiece. So let's start by reading the passage together as we begin this overview in a way that is similar to looking at the masterpiece in a museum where you're just awestruck by it. And Each time you see that painting, you see something new. That's the goal for today, is in this overview, to grab something new. So please turn with me to Matthew 6 and follow along as I read. It should be on your screen as well. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who is in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So as I've already acknowledged, we won't be able to exhaust this masterpiece. Instead, I want to give you one job today. Our brains are probably still fuzzy from the holidays and uh, all the Christmas activity. So I just want to give you one job to focus on. And it's this. I don't want you to focus on your failure in prayer right now. That's your job. No, I don't pray enough or I don't pray very well. I don't sound good when I pray. This sermon is not primarily meant to elicit negative introspection. It's more about encouraging you in prayer. So I want you to keep your head up and pay attention. You see, Jesus didn't teach his disciples to pray just to slap them down when they do it wrong. That's not how Jesus is with his children. He teaches his children to pray because he wants us to pray, and he wants us to pray right. 
So I want you to listen with joy because we're looking at a masterpiece and it's one from Jesus. You see, to, to make this about you and, and to elicit negative introspection is to be like you're at a art museum and you see the Van Goghs and the Monets and the Turners and this beautiful artwork and your response to be, I'm not that good of a painter and to put your head down and spend the rest of the time walking around sulking instead of looking at the beautiful masterpiece and artwork of painters. So let's look to this masterpiece of Jesus. Let's gaze at it. Let's enjoy it together for this time. I tried to capture the aim of this sermon with the following sentence. So for you note takers out there, this is kind of the primary thesis that I'm, I'm trying to show from this passage and we'll spend the rest of the time demonstrating it. Prayer is a personal and intimate expression of humble dependence on God's unique ability to act for his people's greatest needs when called upon. That's a lot. Let me do it one more time. Prayer is a personal and intimate expression of humble dependence on God's unique ability to act for his people's greatest needs when called upon. I want to unpack that a little more in this overview. And the way we'll do that is by looking at three C's, the letter C, three C's in this passage that I think lay that out. The first C sets the stage and the other two are made up of six petitions that we find in the actual content of the Lord's Prayer. So let's begin with that first C. Number one is the context of the Lord's Prayer. And I see this in verses 5 through 8 in particular. And I think this is the main area that we miss when we talk about the masterpiece of the Lord's Prayer. Our familiarity with the actual prayer may make it difficult for us to, it may overshadow actually the circumstances that are happening when Jesus is teaching his disciples how to pray. And I really think it's vital for our, for our understanding of the content of the prayer to understand the context of the prayer. So what's going on here? What's, what's the context of Jesus' teaching on prayer? Well, the first thing that we see here in the context of the Lord's Prayer is that it is personal and intimate practice. And Jesus constructs his argument for the manner in which we pray with a contrast, a contrast between the wrong way to do it and the right way to do it. First, vi- first five begins... When you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. And then in contrast, it says, when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. Then in verse 7, when you pray, do not heap up empty words as the Gentiles do. Do not be like them. So there's this negative side to it to start with. Jesus is saying, don't be like these people. So let's explore that briefly. You see, how one should pray may not have been obvious to the original hearers because they had such bad modeling by their so-called spiritual leaders. Jesus refers to those that pray wrong as hypocrites, which I interpret to be the Pharisees and the religious leaders of, those, of that day. We see an example of this in Luke 18 when uh, the Pharisee who is there praying publicly in front of everyone functionally worships himself publicly and talks about how great he is, that he's not like this other guy over here. And then he goes on to list his good deeds for all of those around him to hear. But Jesus isn't interested in the facade of religiosity. He's not interested in the performance. Further, he tells his people not to focus on attempting to impress God with many words. And he references the Gentile pagan world that was filled with incantations and rituals and the massaging of deities for the worshiper to get what they want. Jesus is not interested in his people mindlessly chanting over long periods of time because that's not the way the God of the Bible acts. He acts according to his own will, not by us manipulating him by saying the right thing. Jesus says, don't do what they do. Spiritual flexing, 
and overwhelming God with noise are poor strategies for hearing God's voice and for God's vo ear to hear you. The cool thing is Jesus is not content with just telling us what not to do. He offers, by contrast, some insights into what prayer actually is. He says, when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. The teaching for us to go to a place of secret, it may be hyperbole to make a point. It may be metaphor to go into the prayer room of our hearts every time we pray. Or it may be literally one of the primary ways that Jesus sees his people acting out prayer by going to a secret place. But few commentators disagree that the point Christ is making here is that prayer is intensely personal and it's an intimate experience directed towards God, less so than the people around us. R. Kent Hughes notes in his commentary on the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus isn't restricting his followers from any public prayer. He's condemning the desire to be seen praying publicly for selfish reasons. He says Jesus was emphasizing that prayer is essentially a conversation between the believer and God. It is intrinsically private, not exhibitionist. At the heart of this teaching, at the heart of the context of the Lord's Prayer, is that your prayer life is to be marked by real conversations with God, public or private. The context of the Lord's Prayer is about you and God talking first and foremost. So that's the first C, the context of the Lord's Prayer. Next, we'll look at the second C, the content of Godward prayer. You see, the very same emphasis on the personal intimate nature of prayer is expressed in the introduction of the content of Jesus' prayer in verse 9, where Jesus starts telling us what to pray. Primarily because Jesus begins with our relationship to God and expands on it with the first petition. I put those two together. So the, um, the, the introduction, the salutation, and the first petition are together when I say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Jesus begins with, Our Father in heaven. And I just want to stop right there and say, what an amazing, seemingly contradictory, but true title this is. It, it highlights our closeness and relationship to God the Father while highlighting that he is something other and unique in his dwelling place in heaven where he reigns. Our Father, truly, in heaven, truly. <laughs> this is absolutely a statement of close relationship to God, one that should be cherished. It's a beautiful thing worthy of celebration. Once his enemies, now seated at his table. The response should be, Jesus, thank you. But the very first petition of this prayer demonstrates that our cherished relationship does not open the door to flippancy or irreverence. Because right after our Father in heaven is the, the petition to, may your name be hallowed. Hallowed be your name. Our familiarity and our relationship must be seasoned with reverence. And that reverence continues to be on display in the second petition, your kingdom come. His rulership and his reign to be known here on earth. The king that is reverently worshipped, he has a kingdom and a reign. You see, theologians and scholars have argued about what sense the kingdom should be taken here. Is it a statement of the reign and rule within our hearts or in the hearts of his followers throughout redemptive history? Or is it a statement for the desire of the return of Christ, the, the future kingdom that will be fully known one day when he returns? My thought on this is why make a distinction? Clearly, we long for, the, for God to continually and purposefully reign more in our daily lives. And clearly, we desire Christ to return 
and the glory of his reign to be fully realized and experienced. So I'm happy to say that this is a prayer that his glorious reign may be known then, now, and forevermore. The third petition in this prayer is your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And if asking God for his reign to be realized is not bold enough prayer, this third petition goes the next step further by acknowledging pure submission to his will. You see, your will be done is not a casual throwaway phrase. I would argue it might be one of two of the most intense petitions, particularly for us in our modern times, with freedom being our cry at any given time. If we really reflect on what we're saying when we say your will be done, this is an admission of our desire for God's perfect will to be manifested here on earth. And not just here, but here too. Not just how it relates to people out there or his general will for all things, for the well-being and good. I mean, how can we say we want his will to be known here if we don't apply that personally to us? Why that's difficult is because later in this very gospel account of Matthew, we read one of the harder things to read (laughs) about God's will for us and particularly Jesus' will for his followers. Jesus says, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. That's a sobering reality when we're asking for God's will, when we're seeking to follow him and follow his lead. We are saying a petition to submit our lives to everything to die to self, to sacrifice. Following the will of the Father here and now on earth, not when we're perfect in heaven standing before him. And that does not happen on its own. So I can see why this petition is here. We must ask for help in dying to self, in seeking his true will for our lives, not what we want, but what he wants. All three of these petitions taken together, they shape us towards Godward prayer. While the second half of the prayer expands our Godward praise to include our godly dependence on him for our needs. I'm referring to verses 11 through 15 here, and I've titled this section, The Consequence. It's the third C, The Consequence of Godly Dependence. When I say consequence, I don't mean it in the negative sense of like the the bad consequence of a, a poor choice, but more like the result. The second set of petitions here, they highlight our needs in light of the praise that we've been instructed to give. So Jesus again directs us Godward. And how does he do that? Well, the fourth petition is give us this day our daily bread. And the request here is an obvious reference to sustenance and provision. It's probably metaphorical in nature. It it most likely does not flatly mean, can I have some bread, Lord? Um, Though bread is wonderful. Um, But it's most likely to ask for things that we are tempted to take for granted, these daily needs. And to do that is to understand who he is and to acknowledge that he is the provider of those things. I honestly don't think that this is a huge issue for most of us. In fact, uh, we want to be careful about our prayers only being asking for things. Um, It's fine to ask for provision. In fact, we're commanded here to do it. And I think that the following petitions help actually shape us away from making prayer primarily give me what I want and help us hone in on, Lord, I here's what I need, and then adding to our prayers beyond just, Lord, give me what I want. You see, the next and fifth petition that we read, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. That expands beyond just, Lord, may I have, even when legitimate, to give us some other things to pray about. 
You see, this petition is one that, in my opinion, has the real ability to shock our senses. So I do want to spend a little more time here. But it's really important at the beginning here to say what this does not mean. I don't believe that every time we pray, we're asking God to forgive us in a way that saves us. Because we are forgiven at the moment that our stony hearts are made fleshy and that they beat new life by the power of the Holy Spirit, by faith in Jesus Christ and repentance from sin. So I I don't think that's what's going on here is that we daily ask for that. We can daily celebrate that. What I do think is going on here is this ongoing confession throughout the life of the believer that seeks forgiveness for the benefit of relational communion with God when we sin. It's referred to here as our debts. And in that case, we find, especially in verses 14 and 15, where it's elaborated on, that there's this interrelation between forgiveness from God and the forgiveness that we grant others. And in case you think this might be an isolated statement, I wanted to point you to maybe even a harsher (laughs) description of this interrelation between uh, forgiveness from God and forgiveness towards others. From later in Matthew, in Matthew 18, Jesus tells a frankly terrifying account of a man who was forgiven a massive debt by his master only to turn around and punish someone else for a much smaller debt. And that master that forgave the man, when he found out about this, he responded with fury. So listen as I read verses 32 through 35. This is the master speaking to the unforgiving servant. You wicked servant. I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. And here's Jesus speaking. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Whew, that's heavy. Aaron, I thought this was supposed to encourage me in prayer. Remember, you said, don't make this about me. Don't feel down. Well, I do think that there's something encouraging to take from this. It's one way to look at it uh, negatively. There is a positive side to this, and I want to highlight that. You see, it's a true kindness of God to leave a path to a forgiving life. He's forgiven the unforgivable in us, and we as his children are expected to reflect that forgiveness to others. Until we're willing to do that, fellowship with him can be impeded. It can be hampered. Not unsaved, not kicked out of the family. But he disciplines us as a loving father when we have infighting in the family. When we hold on to bitterness and unforgiveness towards other. So as hard as it may be to hear, be encouraged that God's desire for his people is not just that we pray to him for forgiveness. He wants us to live out our forgiveness to our debtors. The sixth and final petition is lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. At the heart of this petition is an amazing confession of dependence on our sovereign deliverer. This petition is unique in the sense that um, it's asking God not to do something. So what's going on with this phrase, lead us not into temptation? Temptation here is likely referring to trials. The word for temptation can be an explicit reference to someone tempting someone else directly to sin, trying to get them to sin. And it's used that way sometimes throughout the New Testament. But for the most part, and I believe in this case, I think it's best understood as trial or testing. The main reason I believe that is because it's God leading. And we know from James 1 that God cannot be tempted, 
nor does he tempt any man with sin. He's not the, the source of temptation to sin, and he's clearly not trying to get us to sin. Instead, he allows trials into our life to shape us, to mold us, to make us more like Christ. James goes on to explain that we actually grow in our maturity through that process of facing trial. So I don't think this petition is a prayer asking God to remove the growth of our faith in any way. Because taken together with the phrase, but deliver us from evil, or as many scholars prefer, the evil one, we get the sense that the Lord's prayer is teaching us to ask God to keep us from trials that would overcome us by the power of the evil one. This is asking God to be the deliverer that he is, that he would lead us in a way where we would not be set in a place where we could be overcome by the evil one. This is a prayer for God to deliver us from our sin nature and from the temptations around us, that we would stand firm in trial by his power. So that was our overview. That was our look at the masterpiece. And it was a glance, I admit that, but I hope a helpful one. In the beginning of 2021, and as I said, things are still weird. So I just want to end with three quick applications from these three C's to help us stabilize and to help us focus at the start of this year, particularly in the realm of prayer. The first one, first application, from the context of the Lord's Prayer We should actually pray to God in 2021. Don't get caught in the error of mainly talking about God around other people or having this inward dialogue in your head and considering that prayer. Do you know what I'm talking about when I say that? Like the person that thinks that they're God's gift to the English language, they've achieved mastery of crafting words and the person that don't talk so good they're at risk of the exact same problem, of of making it about them. So let's commit together to say what we mean in prayer to God. Not what sounds good, and let's not stress about how we sound to others. Let's talk to God publicly or privately. I think that falls in line with what Jesus' intention for this teaching is, for the context of the Lord's Prayer, is to focus on Him when we pray. Second, the content of Godward praise, we learn that we should make an effort to express gratitude in our prayers. And I would add more than 2020. <laughs> 2020 was a tough year. It was probably hard for us at times to, to offer up praise and express gratitude. But even in 2020, we saw God work and we see him continuing to work. Jesus as at the head of his church. You see, the content of Christ's teaching on how to pray has a decidedly Godward focus in the first three petitions. And we truly have a reason to worship in prayer. He made himself a sacrifice for sinners. He died, was buried, and rose again to new life that by our faith and repentance in him, he would secure our ability to be with him forever worshiping him forever. If praise can't be part of our prayers in light of that, do we truly believe who he is and what he's done? And third and finally, the consequence of godly dependence teaches us that we should ask of God and expect him to do amazing things in 2021. We should feel freedom to go to him with our requests. And don't forget that God can do far more than our own finite brains can ever come up with. So so pray with your needs in mind. Pray with his kingdom in view, asking it to be known here. And pray that, that prayers that are in line with his will, seeking his will for your life, not your own direction. And then expect amazing things from his hand in 2021. I was reminded of Ephesians 3, 20 to 21. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think. 
according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. We have been granted an awesome privilege by God as his children to come directly to him in prayer. And we have this example of Jesus' masterpiece of teaching on prayer to guide us. I hope, and more importantly, I pray, 2021 is marked by this kind of prayer in your life. Godward praise, godly dependence, directed to God primarily. And I hope that's true of us all here at Hope Fellowship. Will you bow and pray with me? Heavenly Father, I can't coax you with fancy words. And I'm addressing you directly, Lord. I simply ask that you will help us to be more and more dependent on you this year. To lean on you in humble prayer. To take hold of your teaching here, this masterpiece, and to look more and more throughout the year. To glean more and more from it. Will you help us to pray as your son taught his disciples? Will you help us to take hold of this kindness? I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Sure.
But to rage against the captain And with the sword that makes the wounded whole We will fight with faith and valor When faced with trials on every side We know the outcome is secure And Christ will have the prize for which he died an inheritance of nations Come see the cross Where love and mercy meet As the Son of God is stricken Then see his foe Lie crushed beneath his feet For the conqueror is risen And as the stone is rolled away Christ emerges from the grave. This victory march continues till the day. Every eye and heart shall see Him. So Spirit come, put strength in every stride. Give grace for every hurdle that we may run. To win the prize of a servant good and faithful, a saint of old still light the way, retelling triumphs of his grace. We hear their calls and hunger for the day when with Christ we stand in glory, a saint of old still light the way. Retelling triumphs of His grace We hear the calls and hunger for the day When with Christ we stand in glory I hope you've been encouraged by looking at the Word today and looking specifically at prayer. I want to end with that benediction from Ephesians 3, uh, verses 20 and 21, just as a reminder that we should expect great things for God when we pray, e even better than what we ask for. So please hear the benediction. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Hope Fellowship, let's begin 2021 in great joy and great peace.